please welcome Hildur Gudnadotter. So, congratulations on everything that's been happening for you around this, and uh, of course you're here this weekend for the Grammys. You're nominated for Chernobyl. Um, how are you, <laughs> yes, how are you holding up uh, with all of the, the activity? I don't even know myself how I'm doing. It's pretty, uh, it's been a pretty wild time, those months. Well, uh, I want to add to the, the Grammy nomination for this weekend, of course, um, the Academy Award nomination and also the Golden Globe win recently. And um, I saw your acceptance speech at the Golden Globes. And something that occurred to me uh, is how, um, how cheerful of a person you seem to be, how light on your feet, um, laughing and very joyful. And that seems in striking contrast to the music <laughs> and the material that you're, you're working to. to. Um, how do you explain that dichotomy? Yeah, it's not the first time I get this question, I can tell you that. <laughs> it's a, a lot of times when people you know, either know me or know my music and get to know the other side, they normally say, like, no, that's, that's not you. <laughs> But uh, I think um, I think we all have a, a lighter side and a, and a darker side, and um, I think just luckily for my family, the, my darker side comes out more in my music than than in my personality. <laughs> I think I'd be pretty terrible to live with that if I was, you know, the person that my music is. <laughs> I'd be pretty dramatic. <laughs> but I think it's it's. Um, yeah, it's it's just like the um, music is is uh, my place of of contemplation. So that therefore, like it's it's very often kind of slow and and introverted because I'm normally a rather outgoing and cheerful person myself. And and uh, making music is is my place of just going inwards and 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 um, exploring the sides of me that that are not that are not visual in the day to day life. You mentioned family, and your upbringing is basically in a music world, uh, and your, your parents. And um, I wonder if there was a moment in your life where you really came to appreciate this uh, conversation internally, this uh, superpower, <laughs> or, or the potential of that world for you. Was there a life event or anything that you recall when it, when it kind of clicked for you? Um, no, not really. I just, um, music was just always the normal thing to do in my family because ev everyone played music and it was just like the, you know, the thing that you did. So I just did it as well. And, and, um, I never really made any conscious decision about becoming a musician, but I just, I really enjoy music as a form of communication. And so therefore I, I, um, I tend to work mostly with my friends or my family, like people that know me really well and, and uh, people that I can have a really deep um, dialogue with. And, and I think that that is something that, you know, if you compare it to dating, if you're always on your first date, you're always kind of, you're always on the surface level. And, and with, with music, I think it's the same thing when you're constantly just, you know, staying on the surface, it, it kind of, it's not very um, inspiring, I think. So I like to go, really, really deep, and I'd like to work with um, yeah, my family and my friends that I grew up with as, as a way of just communicating and, and exploring the, the kind of deeper sides of communication. I, I was interested to learn of your background in different uh, bands and uh, experimental projects and collaborations. Um, Johan Johansson uh, was a great collaborator. Um, and I wonder how all of that kind of contributed to uh, your your skill set as a as a film composer, um, creating an opportunity for all of that work and that collaboration. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's it's um, you know when you're working on a film, it is such um, such a large part. Uh, actually, the biggest part of making a film is having a dialogue, and is to uh, that is it's the um, the process of of uh, 
of communicating through, you know, through music or, or visuals or performances or, or, you know, written text, you know. So, so there's, um, there's such a huge amount of dialogue in, involved in that. And I think um, because I really love to work, um, work in music in, in dialogue, like I really love to explore with people, you know, what, what are we trying to do, what are we trying to say, and what can we explore, what can we find out, and, and you know, how can we, how can we, you know, feed our curiosity for for the for the story and and you know make it interesting and and I think as I think it just all works together really well because I th I think um, there's a lot of uh, exploration in in making films or at least the films that I find exciting are are you know really going towards towards the more explorative side and. And that's the music that that inspires me the most as well. Music that's like you know, um, exciting and 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 exploring new sounds and new instruments and new new ways of of you know playing music or making music or recording music or or you know there's just this kind of openness in music I, I really like. How do you uh, stay kind of keeping that sense of wonder and that curiosity with music? Is it just the potential of each collaboration or are there kind of exercises or tricks that you have like maybe relocating to a different space or things to trigger the sense of wonder you have towards making music? Yeah, that's a great question. I think... Um, for me, it has a lot to do with building instruments. So I, I do that a lot, and I, I really love um, I really love exploring um, um, acoustic or electroacoustic instruments. So I really love exploring um, instruments and acoustics, and you know, uh, recording in a space. And I, I, I just I'm kind of hopelessly curious in in that regard, and that. That always really fires me up when, when I when I get stuck. I'm like, well, how does this work? Like, how does it? What if I turn it around? What if I you know, move it around? There? I saw a photograph of you, and it looks like a cello that's maybe got some kind of mechanical attachment on the side. Yeah, you're probably talking about the um, the haltrophone, which is the, actually the, one of the main instruments in in this score. So it has eight strings, and there's um, a pickup or like a microphone on every string, and there's four strings above and uh, four strings below, and then there's a speaker on the back. So it, it kind of creates this feedback mechanism. So it's almost like a Jimi Hendrix cello. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, let's talk more specifically about Joker for a, for a moment. And I know we don't have a whole lot of time with you uh, before you're you know directed at the next <laughs> <laughs> event. Um, this coffee is going to help a lot. <laughs> Uh, I, I understand you wrote much of the score bef before really seeing picture or based on the script. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I started writing, uh, writing the music just um, as Todd was kind of finalizing the script. And, and uh, he, he was kind of, um, uh, he's really influenced by music and he listens to music all the time when he's writing. And, um, and he really wanted the music to be a strong part of this film. And, and, um, the music editor Jason Ruter, who has worked with Todd for about ten years, he, he said to him, "Like you're going to want to hire this woman to compose the music." And and he said, "Well, okay, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I'll check check her out." And uh, so he sent me the script, and I was when he first contacted me, I was a little bit, you know, um, afraid that it was going to be like a action movie. So I, I said to him, "Like." Ah, probably not the right person to, <laughs> to hire if you're doing like an action action thriller and, and he said like well just read the script and, and take it from there and I and I did and and it's one of the most fantastic scripts I've I've ever read. It's really, really, really so well written and um, and it goes um yeah it touches so many many places in in kind of human um uh like the the the, hu the the flaws of being a human, you know, it's it's really you know kind of goes really really deep on that level. I think, and I, I was just really really interested in that, and I was found it fascinating that that to go this way about this character that we know so well, and 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 um, that it was a really interesting kind of starting point for him to have be born. And uh, yeah, so I read the script, and and Todd just you know asked if I was if I was interested in writing some music based on my feelings of the script so I, I did and and uh, 
so the the main themes were written just at at that point. So the you know the bathroom dance and uh, and defeated clown, where he's um, which is kind of the his his emotional theme, like which starts out when he's being beaten up by the kids in the in the beginning, and then he gets angrier and angrier with that theme that was written also before mm. before they started shooting. And so the music was able to, you know, he was able to play the music on set, and so the music was able to kind of inspire the performances and the and the pacing and the cinematography and the kind of general feeling on set was was kind of being led by the music. I, I want to be sure that the people know how how rare and unusual it is for this to be the order of things. <laughs> um, it just doesn't really happen in Hollywood. And I do want to ask you about the bathroom dance because it's remarkable. But um, I thought it was very classy at, sh at the Golden Globes uh, acceptance speech that the third person you acknowledged, first the director, then Joaquin, and then the music editor. Um, and that really, uh, music editors are really unsung heroes in, in this process. And so it's rare for them to get any credit, honestly. Um, but they play such an important role in shaping the score. But much more often, there's a temp score that's been done before the composer comes on board at all. And so that's sort of the template and can be, I'm sure, very frustrating and very limiting for composers that want to explore the possibilities. So I do think it's remarkable that you got in so kind of early in the creative process. Is that, is that kind of a prerequisite for, for you when you look at projects? I definitely like to come in as early as possible, like if if the if time and and budget and all of that allows, because like um, uh, I mean, of course, it's w when you work in this way, it's of course like way more time consuming. Because I was working on this project for about one and a half years, so it's it's a you know it's a big commitment. But I think as as an artist, it's it's much more fulfilling for me to be a part of the DNA of the of the film and the storytelling and and um, so I definitely yeah the earlier I can come on the better and um, um, and the, you know there's then it's less likely for exactly this to happen that you have to kind of end up copying some temp yeah. <laughs> temp score and I think Jason the who the uh, Jason Ruder the music editor he was just such a I mean, he was the one that was responsible for hiring me in the first place because he said, like, this is the person you want for this. And, and he was kind of really clear on that. And, and he was also able to, because he's worked with Todd for such a long time. And, and so he was able to meet the it between me and Todd really beautifully. And, and uh, I just, I really appreciated that because it's, uh, like I was saying before, you know, it's, it's just such a dialogue and... Um, having a dialogue with someone that you know really well is much easier than, you know, with someone that you don't know at all and you're maybe, like, you know, re really rarely in the same room even. <laughs> so so it was just, he was just such a wonderful, wonderful bridge between me and Todd and, and he kept the, he kept the atmosphere just so wonderfully creative. Like, he was really, like, really careful of, of steering all the dialogue into just, like, the creative dialogue and I really appreciated that. Uh, take us back to the bath bathroom dance. Um, when you first saw the footage, was the music was the music already kind of cut to picture, or take us to that point? Yeah. So, so the bathroom dance. It was one of the um, one of the earlier scenes they shot, and it was um, it's kind of like this this uh, the transformation scene when he goes from from being Arthur Fleck and, and turns into Joker and and. Um, and Joaquin was having a bit of a hard time finding his way into that transformation because the scene, as it was scripted, was was kind of um, it was kind of straightforward. Like he hit the gun and then you know, like look in the, looked in the mirror and said shit or whatever. You know, it was it was kind of just straightforward and, and dry. And Joaquin wasn't connecting to it. And then Todd said to him, he was like, well, I mean, maybe we should have a listen to. Uh, what Hilter sent me and, and started playing him this this music and, and Joaquin just started improvising this uh, this dance and basically the scene as it is in the film is, is him pretty much improvising and responding to the music so he's listening to exactly this music while he's doing this uh, this dance and uh, so the music was able to kind of take him through the transformation and that, that was a huge turning point for him he said to me later. 
and um, and it was sort of one of the it was the first scene that they sent to me from the dailies, like when the you know the, the I often get like scenes that from the from the set, just like single scenes, and uh, and it had the music in it, of course, because it was playing on set, and it was just so marvelous to see, you know how, because I I didn't really. I have any dialogue with Joaquin, so I didn't, and I didn't tell Todd either about like what I was feeling when I when I wrote this music. But but, as you can see, uh, how I speak, like <laughs> my hands are moving quite a lot. And Joaquin, of course, had no idea about that. So these movements were pretty much identical to what I had experienced when I when I wrote the music, and it was just so magical to see that happen on on the screen. I seen Joaquin, you know, just kind of. Improvised this incredibly powerful performance, just literally to the music and channeling it, and it was just really magical. Well, I, I think you know the result of all of that magic is one of the most memorable scenes in film we've witnessed in a long time. <laughs> um, you are headed back to Berlin after the Grammys this weekend. You have some concerts. Yes. Yes. Um, I want to ask you if if Berlin as a city and its personality and character helps you uh, helps inform what you do as an artist because it's a city with such an interesting character and history, even recent history. Um, and does it give you kind of a safe haven from Hollywood <laughs> in a way for you just by distance? It kind of you know no one can pop in the studio and and um, look over your shoulder. But yeah. tell us how how Berlin kind of affects you creatively. Yeah. Yeah, Berlin is fantastic. It's um, it's uh, a really spacious city, so you never feel kind of um, locked in. Like you know, if you're if you're in London or Paris, you know they're so kind of they're so cramped, so you never you you always feel like you just have elbow space, and um, and it's really um, easy to com go completely unnoticed in Berlin. Like you can go forever without without really bumping into anyone or seeing anyone and I, I really like that because mm -hmm. it kind of gives you a lot of um, a lot of actual you know both headspace and, and actual space and um, and there's also something about the something about the energy of the city that's it's um, it's rather heavy it's kind of hard to explain if you haven't lived there but a lot of people that live there get kind of depressed but for me it, it's it's um, it's kind of perfect because um, I'm a pretty high energy person, and if I'm staying in like high energy places, like high energy cities, like New York or or someplace like that, I just I start kind of running in circles. So Berlin is kind of nice for me to to it balances me out pretty well, and I I really I really need the seasons as well to be able to write. Like I I couldn't live here. I I couldn't. <laughs> I really need to. I need the, the you know the darkness and the cold and then the you know the fall and the the spring. <laughs> one one thing I noticed uh, about uh, Berlin is how much graffiti there is, and for me, that that just showed me how it's just bursting with creative energy. People just want to express themselves in these ways, like just tagging on a wall. You know, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of graffiti in Berlin. Yeah, exactly, and it's also it's just um, a lot of artists. Um, go there. It's relatively cheap, yeah. so so a lot of artists go there basically because they can live longer of their grants or like whatever w work they have from someplace else, and they they come to Berlin to uh, to live, and that's also one of the reasons why I moved there in the first place because I, it just allowed me to the space to um, to really devote myself to to the work that I was doing and I, I didn't need to like work in a bar or anything to to pay my rent so and like you know if it I was kind of choosing between New York or, or Berlin and New York I would have you know probably not lasted very long <laughs> so it just allowed uh, it allowed me and, and a lot of people who live there just to just to concentrate on their art and, and and there's yeah a lot of artists there sure so my last question before we maybe um, turn it over to the audience, if you guys have any questions in our final few minutes, but now that you've really established yourself at the highest levels, <laughs> is there a kind of film that you'd like to do from here? I mean, would you like to do a, a rom-com? <laughs> <laughs> da -da 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 yeah, da exactly. Uh, yeah, is there a type of film you'd like to do? Um, no. I don't really know. I just I try to always just take 
each um I I try not to to over analyze things or decide too many things, you know, un until they kind of just fall on my in my lap, and then I examine them, and you know, I, I have a look at if there's something I have to add to to this uh, story, you know, then then I, I I'll do it. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, it's 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 more it's more I'm more kind of pro project by project driven than genre driven, or or you know, um, I'm also not very um, despite everything that's happening now, I'm also not very kind of you know ambitious and, and you know getting to the top or anything like that it's just i don't know what the hell happened this, <laughs> this <laughs> year i've been doing this for 20 years and all of a sudden everything just explodes <laughs> but uh so i'll uh, yeah I'll, I'll i'll just take it you know i'll keep yes. working on that pace i think just work take, on take your right? time enjoy yeah. <laughs> enjoy this moment enjoy yeah. this moment in life yeah. um so does anyone have a, a great question okay and i'll be the roving microphone here for hilder Yes. Um, what's your name? Monica. Hi, Hildur. Thank you so much for sharing your gift with us. Excuse my voice. Um, considering that it was different to be working from the script rather than from a finished product, what was that like for you being that the transformation of Arthur, the way that Todd originally envisioned him, to what we finally see on the screen is so different? I read one of the leaked scripts and he was not as likable as to me, he ended up being on the screen. What was the impact of, on, uh, of that on your work? Did you have to go back and forth and think about? Um, well, I think the initial themes were were um, were kind of exactly how I had imagined them. It was kind of, for me, it's it's quite similar to. Um, what happens like physic physically and, and um, emotionally when you read, you know, because then you have to kind of, you have to make up the whole scenario and the tempo when you're reading. And it's a little bit the same with music. I think when you're, when you're writing music, you have to kind of visualize from the same place of, of experiencing. Um, and when I read the script, he was, he was pretty much like exactly like this to me. And, and, and it was, um, um, but really beautiful to see how Joaquin tapped into exactly that, and he just like it was it was like it was almost like it was like telepathic how how Joaquin was just you know exp exper experiencing him in the in the same way as me. So I think it's it's yeah it's it's one of the most beautiful collaborations I've I've ever had. So okay, I saw a hand over here. Hello, uh, thank you, Hilda, for being here. Just a hypnotic film. I'm uh, curious if it has sunk in yet that you've created an iconic work of art. And if it has sunk in, when did it sink in? No, that, that definitely <laughs> hasn't sunk in. I am, um, you know, I'm I'm so funny when I'm when I'm working. I'm I'm so fully focused on it, and I'm just completely concentrated on what I'm doing. And then you know, when I look up, I'm just like, whoa, what? <laughs> you know, and I'm having an extended moment like that of just looking up, and it's it's very um, it's very confusing, honestly, <laughs> all the noise that's happening around me, and and I haven't really, yeah, I haven't really been able to process it, but it's it's just, I mean, it's just it's so special when you write music and when you're just you know you're trying to be so just honest and and you know to to the point as 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 you can and and it's just i mean marvelous that that um when you feel that so many people are listening and so many people are completely open to what you're saying and and and, and playing and you know that's just truly truly beautiful thank you <laughs> okay we have time for one more question before hilder has to get on her way yes sir what's your name hi my name is jeremy um Thank you so much for being here. I've just loved your music since Chernobyl, and I've like gone through your back catalog, and it's just all amazing. Um, so as I mentioned, you did do Chernobyl, which hopefully you do get the Grammy for tomorrow night. Um, and I'm curious what, in your experience, the difference is between composing for a film rather than a TV show. Mm -hmm. And also, I know like for Chernobyl, you um, recorded sounds at um, a nuclear power plant around, I believe, Poland. And I'm wondering if you did like anything like that to get in the kind of feel of things for Joko. Yeah. 
Well, the biggest difference for me between these two projects was that one one of the story was real and one of them wasn't. So it wasn't so much that it was TV and film, it was just like what kind of story it was. And, and for me, it was really important that the music of Chernobyl was almost factual, you know, that I wasn't over-dramatizing anything or that I wasn't kind of making up any side stories of, of you know, um, what what that went that didn't happen in reality because I think it's so important for for the people that you know lost their family members and and friends you know who are still who are still here today that that they get a kind of um, yeah not like a over dramatized sensualized version of of what happened and I I that's why I felt it was really important to to have the music based in in reality and have the music kind of based uh, in these recordings to really understand what what um, radioactivity sounds like and what what these what these spaces sound like because for me like this this story you know one of the biggest characters of course in the story is the radiation and the radiation we, we can't film it and we can't see it so I thought the music was was the best way to to feel the radiation and, and to be able to be as honest about what radiation really is like. I felt that I needed to go down this road of, of just have, having it actually radioactive. So, so that's why the music is all, all based on, on, on these real recordings. And, and I thought it was important also when I want to record a power plant that I wasn't making it do anything, you know, so I just wanted to record what the power plant itself was actually doing and, and you know, the the whole process was both reading the script and, and uh, doing the recordings and then making the music was, was really um, driven by deep listening and just like listening really carefully to what the space is saying and, and what, the, what the radioactivity is, is, you know, what it sounds like and what it feels like. And, and, uh, and the Joker, of course, being a fictional story and, and a very fictional character, although you know, it's it's a character that we all, you know, most of us, you know, or at least from my generation, grew up with. So he's almost real to us. He's been around for so long, but you have a little bit more space to 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 play with what you know what what can happen musically, and because the music is is, it can be so emotionally manipulative, in uh, in films, and and um, I think fiction films are really just fun platform to explore, like you know, fantastical feelings and and uh, so it was it was much more um fictional the music and joker than Chernobyl. thank you so much for your time today and thank um you. thank you for your artistry <laughs> and thank congratulations you. and the best of luck at the grammys and the academy awards let's hear it for hilder thank you. Thank you. Thank you.